IBM is planting a new flag in the artificial intelligence realm today at its Think conference announcing Watson X. This time, Watson itself isn't the AI so much as it's a set of tools and resources to help customers tailor other AI to their needs. I spoke with CEO Arvind Krishna today and asked why OpenAI and ChatGPT have the spotlight when IBM spent the last quarter century telegraphing this moment with Deep Blue and the original Watson. Take a listen. Some technologies take a time to mature, and I think to give OpenAI credit, they've achieved for AI, kind of what Netscape achieved for the Internet. By the way, the Internet was more than a dozen years old when Netscape came along, but they really helped put it into perspective for the business leaders, for CEOs. It really inspired them to think about what the Internet could do for business. I think OpenAI did exactly that. Now, if we think about the evolution of AI, the, the ones you're mentioning, machine learning, I would say that was maybe the deep blue era. If I look at Watson winning Jeopardy, that was the deep learning era. Very good AI, really useful, but still the burden to get it implemented was high. You had to get labeled data, experts built a model, and after six months of work you could deploy a model, but that's a lot of work and a lot of expense for one task. With this approach of foundation models, you really build the model once, but then you can get 100 tasks done, each one over a weekend, not necessarily with experts. So when you get 100x improvement in the possibility of deploying AI for a business advantage, that seems pretty revolutionary. And that is why I believe this time the adoption is really going to take off because we have met the hurdles of both uh, the cost of a single model as well as of how to get it deployed. That's a pretty big deal, I think. Uh, talk to me about how uh, IBM creates an advantage for itself here in the marketplace. Talking to Satya Nadella over at Microsoft, he's talking about combining the infrastructure with Azure along with, uh, you know, search and some of the applications work that they're trying to do. Different layers, different lines of attack to try to uh, take their cloud momentum into the AI era. How is IBM's hybrid approach potentially going to create advantages for you here when you've got these large hyperscaler players that are also trying to dominate? Look, I think the hyperscaler players will get their successes and uh, with, with uh, a lot of respect for what uh, Satya is doing over at Microsoft, with what OpenAI is doing, actually also with what Google is doing and talking about, there is going to be an approach that succeeds there. But similar to how Red Hat succeeds in a hybrid cl cloud approach, in addition to what people succeed with in public clouds, there are lots of people who are going to worry about the data going anywhere. If I think about audit, you think about compliance, you think about places where they need extreme accuracy, where they need to make sure that the model has only been fed with data that they trust. It has no data from sources that they cannot point to the lineage to. There is an opportunity for us in those enterprises. So giving people the ability, they can decide to deploy it on their own premises, they can deploy it on their their private cloud, they can deploy it in their own dedicated instance on top of Azure and AWS, gives them a deployment option they don't really have with some of the other approaches. Two, okay. we're also going to partner. We had a partnership with Hugging Face. So you can start with models IBM gives you. You can bring in open source models. And by the way, you can train your own model, not just the ones that are the, at the basis of what OpenAI or Microsoft or IBM gives you. I think this does give people a lot of flexibility in how they deploy, and they can meet all the conditions that the enterprise wants as well. Okay. Uh, a few days ago, you announced, I believe, that IBM is freezing hiring in thousands of positions that you think AI is going to potentially make obsolete in the pretty near term. How quickly might we move from AI affecting hiring freezes to AI making uh, actual existing jobs obsolete? And IBM has a lot of employees. There's a big risk there if you've got to cut uh, pretty soon over time because AI is, is sapping the potential productivity of that workforce. Yeah, so, so John, th those media reports covered half of what I said, but not all. Okay. I, I do believe that AI is going to replace a lot of what I'm calling white collar clerical jobs. So the, the ones that are much more repetitive, the ones where people do the same task again and again and again, I think a good 30% of those roles could go away over five years. 
By the way, when you think about 30% over five years, that's actually handled by attrition. That's why I called it. We're not going to backfill those roles. However, at the same time, it's going to create lots of other roles, more roles around AI prompt engineers, more roles around software engineering. As technology becomes more and more competitive, as a source of competitive advantage, companies are going to need to hire more people into those jobs. So I think that the value-creating jobs are going to increase, and I believe our total employment will increase while there will be a reduction in more of those back office roles. I think that's actually goodness. Look, we can take the nature of farming. 1900, 40% of the U.S. population was directly working on farms. Today, it's 3%. The other 37% have plenty of jobs. The nature of roles tends to change. If I follow the U.S. Census, 60% of all jobs changed between 1940 and today. I think this is just the next uh, era of those kinds of changes, and generally the jobs become better, not worse, as time goes on.